It's your boy Beatback. Techno DJ names. Uh, gosh, I feel like if I had a techno name, it would be the screaming, um, the screaming, um, no, 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 screaming, no, uh, no, no, it has nothing to do with screaming. You just said it a minute ago. Yes, what was it? Um, uh, Prescription RX. There we go. And uh, in our continuing efforts to update our knowledge, yeah, data, a bit of recon, the, uh, Intel efforts, mm -hmm. uh, Hunger Force, Sly, Sly. The dog said, by golly, let's dip into some of Brand's childhood favorites and even out the whole imbalance. Yeah, with the 70s, yes. Uh, gosh. Early to mid 90s, I assume you mean. What would be. Oh, the Turtles! Man, yes. Mm. So happy together. No. Man. No. And you and me. No, 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 so no. happy no. together. No, 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 no. Something with Shredder. Uh, oh my gosh, yes. Mid, mid 90s. Uh, the Bebop. The. the, the rock Steady. Oh, that's, that, no. that's from. No, mid '90s dance musicians, Psycho Sonic. That's what it is. Mid '90s dance musicians, Psycho Sonic. That you have your Psycho and you have your Sonic again. Mm -hmm. They are uh, putting it out there, spelling it out for you. Yeah, you don't get a clue for what you're in for. They leave nothing to the imagination. So, Psycho Sonic, group of fellows that I didn't know who were. Yeah, they were. Uh, they were around. For you know, '93 to '97, starting a little beforehand, maybe in a club mix in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. You get the whole Detroit techno thing, don't you? Yeah. Without having to go to Denver, Colorado, you can you can say that again. So yeah, you anyway. get the whole Detroit techno thing, right? Without having to go to Minnesota. Yeah, they were. Uh, they were primarily active. You get the whole Detroit techno. They were primarily active starting around 93 through 97 is when their prime period was. So, industrial group, mm. dance, right, uh, electronic music. I I suppose we I think. we should get into the whole uh, before we get into Yes, the, not only is it one of your favorites. Yeah, it's it is one of my favorites, but there's an interesting question to be had here. Hmm. Are they indeed pinnacle? Can you put them up as one of the great heralding artists of dance music? Oh, like pinnacle contributors? Yeah. yeah. Or do they count as legitimate, uh, the bright lights of the genre? Right. Or do they just see an opportunity and take it type thing? Genre opportunism. Genre, yeah, genre opportunists. Do they do they just do that? So uh, we we of course got to get into the whole uh, delineation. You got to get into. Uh, we we did our crash course actually. to find out. Yeah. Specific. Yeah. I'm going in as a complete novice. Mm -hmm. So so I was able to receive the information right of most of their stuff. CDs. Mm -hmm. He got the intel. Albums and solo album efforts. So, uh, starting off with some of the band members. Uh, most prominent man being uh, Daniel Lenz, with uh, production, mastering, mixing, composition, uh, synth work, maybe a handful of vocals. Uh, Paul Sebastian, composition, production, maybe a little mixing, some guitar, a lot of vocals. Uh, Theodore Beal. Theodore in the house. Yeah, he is in the house. You don't always get a Theodore. Yeah, Theodore Beal did uh, he the lyricist mainly contributions and lyricism. Yeah, writing the lyrics and uh, your boy Mike Larson, who was on the drum machine. Good. And uh, so four white males from from the eighties from Minnesota. Yeah. So. Is who it is. That's right. And, uh, well, we should, uh, probably dip into that first album. So, oh, probably. Yeah. 1993. 93. Correct. Self-titled. Yeah. And, uh, 
this is where the, the you, you, this is where the debate is at its peak. Is it industrial or is it not industrial? Because uh, a different debate. Yeah. Uh, yes, I remember first hearing them a long time ago for like just a few minutes, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Gosh, this doesn't really sound industrial." Does yeah. It? It was kind of like electronic dance music. Yeah, general. it was. It was actually kind of a uh, mis mislabel. Like, like I don't know what to they, count it as. I mean, it sounded kind of darkish, but it yeah. still sounded like dance floor. Right. Well, you you dance beat. You primarily get that through association. They were on the Wax Tracks records. That's right. A uh, family of industrial. Yeah. Along with uh, you know uh, front. 242 and oh huh so who else KMFDM were they yeah they they were all on that label so along with Psycho Sign okay so I can see why people would kind of miss like by association by association yeah but uh, and the themes in the lyrics are yes what do we get it we're we're in the middle of Gen X time aren't we yeah 1993 mm-hmm. The cyber culture, There's plenty of cyber culture elements in there. Uh, it would count. It would. It was uh, released the same year as uh, Billy Idol's Cyberpunk. Mm. So, Cyberpunk was huge. And the theory. Why is it? Why is it that I'm holding my my beloved? Oh yeah, Space uh, Age fidget. Yes. What's uh, it called? There's a lot of extropianism. Yeah, there's a lot of extropianism, whereas entropianism is a negative outlook on sad technological advancement. I didn't know what it was. And uh, we had to push the wiki button. Yeah, we extropy uh, a belief in future technology and the positively like a Star Trek type thing, except except also kind of like the Borg. Yeah, positively impacting. Merging with technology and how that's going to uh, solve most of civilization's problems. I think that's what extropy is. Yeah. As for the album itself, I thought it was from 89. I remembered it as being That's from right. 89. Yes, you accidentally said it. Yeah. We both did. We both did. Yeah, so uh, it has that sound. What did it remind me of? There was the popular uh, stuff from 89 or 90. EMF. Yep. Whoever did that, um, oh, not Marky Mark. Well, it sounded like Marky Mark. Yeah. The Good Vibrations. What's that other one? Uh, it takes two it to takes make a single ride. Yeah. And then uh, all night long, it get the booty on the floor tonight. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, Pump up the jam. Mm -hmm. It had that kind of feel. Pump it up. Yeah, it had a... There was a lot of uh, dance style rapping in it. Oh, rap vocals? I believe the whole thing was rap vocals. Wasn't yeah. Another thing kind of reminded me. Like, what was... what's her name? CNC Music Factory. Yeah, that CNC. Yep. Jump to the rhythm. Jump, jump. You get the whole Detroit techno thing, don't you? Yeah. Without having to go to Denver, Colorado. Yeah, yeah. it's it's that. I mean, uh, get nasty, get there's... naughty. And if you want to, crack a farty. Yeah, there is there is like a hook or two that's sung, but for the most part it's primarily the dance rap of the time. Like, and the entire album is very formulaic. Like, they don't do anything to stray from... Same drum beat. The same drum beat. And uh, similar percussion elements, you mean? Yeah, the same percussion samples. By this time, sampling was a thing. We could have picked a different drum kit high hopes for technology, the belief in a yeah. brighter future. So, I'm not going to blame them for using the same synthesizers, the, the same bass synthesizers. They, it would have been awesome if they chose a handful of different ones, but, I mean, it doesn't stray far from the late 80s high energy dance formula. What about the... Um Ah, yes. Yeah. What would later become known as uh, the uh, stadium, the, the Mortal Kombat, Kombat theme. But before it was called oh, the... Sort of, yeah. Before it was called the Mortal Kombat uh, melody, it was called the uh, 
anthem stadium trance melody formula. It had a name. It whenever whenever you went to a uh, nice big trance event in your local warehouse or your rave or whatever, you always heard that rhythm. It, they, it, it's not original. I mean, if you ask me, they they did it the best, but it's. There's more than one track there's on there. There's more than one person that uses it. And there's more than one track with very little... Uh, sometimes they even use the same exact notes, but just in a different rhythm type thing. So, yeah. Oh, well, you change it up by person. Yeah, so... It, yeah, so we're, we're doing this EDM hard dance number rave in your face. Ah, you're getting your booty on the floor anyway. They were constantly on the floor for two years. Like, just booty after booty was on the floor for two years. The second album was 95, Second, then? Yeah, second album being 95, and it's called Unlearn. Now, this new Unlearn album, almost completely, well, we, you could almost say it's completely different from the first one. Whereas the first one was hard-hitting, Booty on the floor. The second one was kind of laid back, a lot less industrial. Slower? It's a little slower. Yeah. Chilling? Like leading to the credence of industrial versus not industrial. Even less industrial. Mm -hmm. I think you said there were still a couple of dance numbers. I don't remember there were, that at all. They kind of ran together for me at that point. It was uh, the main dance numbers I remember were uh, PGP and. Uh, there, there were a few other ones, but like even the dance numbers were not intense and in your face and full of red pill lyrics like the last one. So, uh, but uh, they they were more experimental in the uh, in composition mix elements. Yeah, I'm not gonna blame them for bringing new mix elements. Uh, I mean, a lot. There were a handful of like ambient atmospheric tracks that if you ask me are just freaking awesome. You can always get behind a like a wider mix, more ambient tracks. The soundscapes? Yeah. And Yeah, I'm still trying to think which yeah, it, uh, I don't remember. But in my brief crash course. You, like now wasn't this your favorite of the two? Oh it, it's it's my favorite of Pretty much all the albums we're going to discuss, but it's definitely the favorite of the two because you don't have a lot to choose from. Like the first one, I like for all the wrong reasons. I like it because it sounds like it's from '89. I like it because it's hard hitting, and I can listen to it ironically, or I can appreciate it, or that type of thing. Whereas the 95 album, The 95 one, to me, is like a genuine, man, this is timeless, and if it's not timeless, it aged very gracefully. Uh, I can definitely get behind nice, clean soundscapes. Mm-hmm. Those, those do or can be, shall we say, timeless. Yeah. So, I think 1995. Yeah, I mean... Album. Uh, there was a third uh, studio album planned for 97, but... Uh, there was some squabbling between the... Dramatic anecdote. ...record company, and maybe there might have been some in-band squabbling as well. Maybe. So, I think you get both. I think you get a label dispute and yeah, band member infighting right. about like who should be in charge of what the final mix was or something. So And it was never released. No. Uh, Supposed to come out in 97? Yeah. Or at least was, was most, for the most part made in 97? Yeah. I mean, both Dan, Daniel Lenz and Paul Sebastian, they both said there are project files. They do exist. I don't have any. They just... Uh, have to be compiled. If we, if we could please compile them and put them out there. Oh, okay. shout out. Yes, fellas, do like Pink Floyd Yeah. and release a posthumous thing so, of past recordings. Yeah, so 
We could theorize that shortly after 97, maybe in the 98 or so, they, they kind of broke up, stopped doing stuff as Psychosonic. But, uh, so we're going to talk about the main people, starting off with Daniel Lenz. Uh, Daniel Lenz, probably in 98, uh, got with this guy named uh, Brent Daniels and created a band for one album called uh, Searching for the End. Came out in 99. So Searching for the End made an album called what? Oh, it was dang it, it was Head Noise. The, that's right, yeah. yes. I remember because of the whole misspelling. That's right. It's dropping was, letters out yeah. in, in, in the commonality of, yeah. It was, uh, basically what they did was they made a group, they, they took the head from Head P.E. Mm. And uh, they spelled noise with a Z. Because it's intense, and uh, they smashed as it. you would in the late '80s. They smashed it together. It's not head noise; it's head noise. It's all one word. You don't even get the head and the noise. It's it's yeah, head, H E D, noise. Yeah. And they made one thing in what '99. '99. Yeah, it was. Uh, we could put it under the pretty industrial. Very Nine Inch Nails-ish category. Oh, okay. Uh, kind of like a... Uh, We're headed back towards industrial? Yes. Okay. It's very industrial. Like, they uh, reminded reminded Russell a lot of uh, Downward Spiral. Oh, did it? I thought that was the one after that. No. 2001 or 99? Uh, they're... No, this Am is I thinking 99. of the other solo album? Yeah. Okay, well anyway, yeah, at, at some point stuff sounded downward spiralish. That's it's not a bad thing though. Not a bad thing in the slightest. Get those thick mixes in there. Because uh, And again, want to get into the themes of merging. Yeah, it's with technology. You have your yeah, you have your technology mix, uh, technology lyrical matter. Uh, kind of depressing lyrical matter too. Like, it's known for not... There is pain greater than yours. Yeah, but, like, there's, uh... As for musical composition, you have your big distorted bass, the industrial-sounding drums, you know. Uh... The Nin soundscapes, yeah. the big trumpet blast from, Dan from Reptile or whatever it yeah. was. Yeah, Daniel Lenz on vocals. Very awesome. But, like... I mean, it, it all sounded pretty depressing. It all sounded pretty industrialish, Except for the last song. That last song is a lot different. It's like a melancholy guitar groove type thing. Probably Brent Daniels' best contribution. Uh, it's like, yeah, he's okay. He is, we're putting up with the mad depression. He's okay, but he's solely on the road, accepting it. The driving thing, yeah. yeah. The, good, the good driving song, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that album art's pretty falling, too. And, uh, I mean, this is the one that grew on me. Like, during high school, I needed no help being depressed. I needed no help being edgy. Teen angst. I needed, and I didn't even want the external factor of somebody making me more pissed off during high school and college. So, I didn't like it back then. I also really didn't care for industrial music all that much back then. Well, but, uh, not only have I got a better appreciation for industrial music as time went on, but I kind of feel like that I'm you know, not angsty enough anymore to let those depressing uh, lyrics even hit. So, we're, so it's a good album. I now give it a good album, whereas before I would have been like thumb sideways. So, yeah, that's the only one they did. Searching for the end, the project kind of fell apart. They, at least it was called Head. Yeah, it was called Head Psycho Sonic. Head noise. noise. So, uh, after that, Daniel Lenz went on to do mainly solo stuff. There was uh, a bunch, there was a handful of movie trailers that I can't recall from the early 2000s or whatever. Uh, 
Yes, they were in like showbiz work. Yeah, weren't they? They were all they they never stopped. If you're worried about them stopping, they never stopped just because they broke up. So it would be another six years before we hear Daniel Lenz's first solo. Six long agonizing years, of which I had absolutely nothing else to do but wait for a Daniel Lynn solo. Relaxed mm-hmm. passion project type yeah. thing. So uh, the first solo album was called uh, The Jump Down. Yeah. The Downward fir- Ramp. <laughs> the first solo the first solo album was called uh, Boulder It's where you take a stick and you pry a boulder out to get it to come out. Yeah. Ah, ram down, stuck in a dream. That's what it was called. Oh, okay. I'm th- again, I'm thinking of something else. Yeah, dumb. <laughs> this is how notable the freaking album is, sarcastically speaking. But, like, uh, I mean, the album art is cool. Don't get me wrong. Like, I remembered the album art, couldn't remember the name. Has a has a freaking side profile of a head that dissolves in the triangles. As oh, yes, yeah, so I remember seeing that, yeah. But... For me, the coolest thing about this album is that Daniel Lenz finally learned how to use break beats. <laughs> I kid you not. This guy made hundreds of thousands of dollars on. And for those that don't know, a break beat is something that uh, is a beat that where the kick switch it up. The kick does not keep falling on you know, the beat. Whereas, with a dance track, it would go with a breakbeat track, it would go like switching it up. No longer a solid Yeah, no longer. Or if you want to make it sound bad, a droning techno beat. You get the whole Detroit techno thing, don't you? Yeah. Without having to go to Denver, Colorado. Yeah, I mean, and I was like, I wanted to shout at the speaker. I was like, yes! Daniel Lenz finally learned how to use a break beat. Oh my god, this is fantastic. So, break through. Uh, as you can expect, using a break beat would require uh, various changes within the composition of the music to go along with the beat. So, we had some funky elements. Hmm. There was a little bit of, there was some funk in there. Uh, heavy, uh, Heavy usage on the uh, giant fat bass lines. Okay. And uh, freaking more samples. There were a lot more samples in this album than. Sound effects? Yeah, sound effects. And uh, there were also a handful of. They went back to. Uh, they went back to the whole rapping thing for a bit. Oh, good. Predominantly. Uh, check it out, where it's like. The divas, like, it was kind of like a diva rap type thing. It wasn't him doing the lyrics. It was the one with the lady, get the guest vocalist? Yeah. Female vocals? Yeah. Who, unfortunately, I can't remember the name of. But, like, that to me stuck out as the prominent vocal track, but, I mean, I think he kicked in vocals on one or two, and your boy Brent comes back for uh, more guitar contributions. Brent from Head Noise. Only now it's credited as Daniel Lenz with Brent Daniels. So, where are we in terms of getting our booty on the floor? Well, uh, I mean, it's not like like I said before the 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 album is more varied. We're not exclusively getting our booty on the floor. Some are, some are, some are, some are. Okay. Two thousand five. Two thousand five. So. For me, it sticks out as the uh, most bland album. Like, it's good, but like, if you were if you put it, if I never heard the album before and you put it in a mix of early to mid two thousands material, along with like Crystal Method and uh, let's Chemical see, Brothers, the Chemical Brothers, and that type of thing. If I never heard the album, I wouldn't be able to pick them out from the rest. But I could pick them out because I've already listened to the album hundreds of times. 
so I would be like, oh, that's Daniel Lynn. No, it's because I already know. Oh, that's Chemical Brothers. Yeah, so. That's that gathering data, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's hardcore intel. We didn't just, uh, or I didn't just gather the normals, but, like, so, there would be another interim starting after 2005 into the next solo, but there was a nice, uh, there was a nice gap where he could, uh, write music for trailers for movies, there was, uh, Hostel Part 3, it oh was, yes, uh, the big name. He was in a couple big name things. Yeah, there was Scary Movie Part Two, I think. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, Edge of Tomorrow is the the pro, the one that he's known for the most. Tom Cruise movie. So, but yeah, he kicked in trailer music for a bunch of movies. There was one that was like hot that just came out. Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, Captain Marvel. He did the trailer music for that. Yeah. So yeah, maybe he got like he's not resting. He's still being Bad. back there. Royalties on... Yeah, maybe, maybe, so, maybe he cleaned up on... What's her names? Marvel? The MCU. Yeah. yeah, so... Yeah, he's not... He's not the old guy that's just sitting back there, you know, being like... Ah. But... Anyway, yeah, in between those times... <laughs> yeah. What, his next solo effort? Up and... Yeah. We're, we're uh, coasting through to like 2012. Like I say, they run together to me. Oh, yeah, this is the 2012 one. Yes. Uh, man. Man. Man machine, I think. Machine. Yes, now we have to find out which is which between the Kraftwerk. Yeah. Yes, what is Kraftwerk's 1978 album, Machine Man mm-hmm. or Man Machine? It's Machine Man. Machine Man. Kraftwerk. Okay, so yeah. his in 2012 was called Man Machine. Man Machine. Wait a minute, no. It would first start with Lou Reed. Yes, yeah, we got 75 a uh, Metal Man. We got a triangle thing going on. Or no, it's called... It's uh, Metal Machine Music? That's right, Metal Machine yeah. Music, or Machine Metal Music. There's right, a lot of metal machine. machine Music. I always mix it up with Metal Man because of Cyber <laughs> No, no, Metal Man. Yeah. There's a lot of machining going oh, on. Oh my goodness, so yeah. Lou Reed... Uh, Kraftwerk 78 and then Daniel Lin's Man Machine Man Man Machine Daniel Lin's Man Machine 2012 so can we mention the dubstep Maestro can you drop like a postmodern Italian type oh yeah uh beat like oh man this I can get used to see Step. Step. I don't think we did yet. Ah. Did we mention the dubstep? It's our chance to talk about dubstep. There's dubstep, baby. The, the wobbles. Of course, you knew I was gonna say you got your dub and you got your step. Yeah. Maestro, can we get like a? Wait, wait, wait. Some of them. Like, some of the songs don't even sound like wobbles. They sound like sirens. Wait, 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 wait. You know. Wait, wait, Yeah. <laughs> wait, woo. Yeah. You know. Like, I just remember every track on the CD being, or almost every track on the CD being a dubstep. Maybe. What else can you say? You have the final step. step. There's dubstep, then there's the final step. <laughs> but, uh,. I mean, yes, what was it? There were John Bonham samples? Yeah, there was a, one. There was a direct John Bonham sample, and then he was able to arrange his drum machine to effectively make the... Make more that sounded like it. The levy. When the levy breaks, but there were others that sounded a lot like it anyway. Yeah, so there's that. You said uh, something about Newmanish synthesizers? Oh, a few tracks. Yeah, the long, the big old long droning one note thing in the background, soundscape feel. Yeah, for your synthesizer thing that was. Uh, I don't know anything about it. Like I say, that, that may or may not be much more common in the EDM world than I know of. But yeah, it reminded me of Gary Newman. And I mean, to be fair, just to not sound like I'm being a prick, there was a handful of awesome songs on there. Uh, Man Machine, the song titled after the album, or would it be the other way around? But 
that that actually have had some pretty kick-ass metal-ish guitars from your boy Brent Daniels. Okay. And uh, keep it grimy. I like it. It's a vic. It's a uh, it's a pleasure thing for me. Guilty pleasure. Pleasure principle. It's uh yeah. So I mean, the thing is though. You dubstep your way through. Yeah. The thing is, if if it's if dubstep stopped with that album, I would have been like, okay, dubstep. You did not. <laughs> okay, dubstep. You had an awesome run. Now, can we please move on to something else? We had a good run. <sighs> we could have had we could have had freaking Daniel Lins write the best dubstep oh, album, but sadly. The excision kept making those Shambhala mixes. Uh, skillet, yeah, he's still around. The Skillet man, yeah, silly. Womp, 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 womp. The MacBook Pro, like, I honestly thought the album was a joke. Well, or or, or <laughs> in, in my usual thing of picking whether or not I can take something seriously and thinking, gosh, does this work have some kind of level of irony yeah. or shade of a sense of humor about it. I, I thought it could just as well have been a right parody mm-hmm. or tribute slash parody. Well, it would it helps that Dubstep even went beyond that level of parody taking itself seriously. So, like, Dubstep was popular. It hit its peak at around 2010 to 2011. But it started sliding off after that album. Probably not coincidental. Or probably coincidental. I want to say it was. But, like... <laughs> but dubstep just kept getting ridiculous up until about 2016 or 17. So... Uh, the fact of the matter being, he made a dubstep album. Yes. That's, that's the brilliant thing to take home from Man Machine. Daniel Lenz made a dubstep album. I stepped three or four dubs yesterday. So, yeah. You get the whole Detroit techno thing, don't you? Yeah. Without having to go to Denver, Colorado. I know what you all might be thinking. Uh, if it counts as genre opportunism? No. Yeah. But, like, I know what you all might be thinking. Oh, and wasn't it? What about your boy Paul? What happened to Paul? Like, Bran, you went on and on about Daniel Lenz. Did Paul have a modicum of success after Psychosonic? Yes, he did. Uh, we're going to kick it off chronologically and doing it, you know, having the best first anyway. So in 2001, he did uh, sound work for the video game Oni came out on the Xbox and later on the PC. Uh, his contributions were uh, a bit more cyberpunkish and relied on synthesizers more than the other two guys who were uh, well known among video game enthusiasts. Uh, Martin O'Donnell from Halo and uh, Michael Salvatore from Halo later. But uh, Paul Sebastian's contributions uh, felt kind of cyberpunkish, like I said earlier. Clearly influenced by uh, the Prodigy machine. Oh, da 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 da. I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Yes, da 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 da. Yeah, da 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 da. Da 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 da. Heavy usage of. Uh, Again, heavy I'm probably usage. a fire starter. Yeah, have it's, it's four or five years later, but I basically still count as a fire starter. Probably more towards before the fat of the land prodigy, but uh, there's uh, clear there's awesome usage of break beats, which he did about four years before Daniel Lens, which is cool, but like. It was because it was because the video game itself called for breakbeat usage. It was more intense than 
stuff that Daniel Lynch was doing for. But well, now, I remember the other two fellas sounding using like orchestra. Yeah, that's right. You can very clearly tell Paul's contributions from uh, Martin O'Donnell's and uh, Michael's because. My stuff is the stuff that sounds prodigy. Mike, yeah. <laughs> Mike's, Michael, Mike's and uh, Martin's, they were like grand, grand symphonic. Movie soundtrack type yeah. thing. And uh, Paul was like, you know, this thing needs a bit more prodigy. So I'm going to put some prodigy in it. So. I'm a bit of German techno. Yes. Ah, oh, yes! Yes. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he went on to uh, 2003. Not much happened in 2002. 2003 rolls around and he remixes, he was chosen to remix uh, Thomas Dolby's. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool, Thomas Dolby. One of our submarines is the name of the song. Now I listened to it. I think one of our submarines came out in 92, and there was like a remixing contest 10 years later, oh, okay. but um, uh, 92, Thomas Dolby, one of our submarines, sounds like something early 90s-ish, because it came out in 92, pretty period. Cool. As you do in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. But uh, 2003. Paul Sebastian's remix. Sounds mid-90s-ish to me. It's only been four years. I mean, <laughs> the early one, the early couple years of each decade basically count as that previous decade. The song came out, the remix came out in 2002, though. <laughs> 2003. Yeah, it had only been a four-year difference. But, the thing of it is, though... It's the timeless, it's the unlearned qualities, it's Paul Sebastian's ethereal voice, there's a... Clean soundscape? Clean soundscapes, great production, I'm not gonna knock it because it sounds dated, because it's the timeless, better version of being dated, so... Well. And also, in 2003, he uh, went through an artist name change. It's this. He what? Betamax? Yeah, he uh, he changed Betamax. No, he didn't call himself Betamax. Uh, like Cheney. He uh, uh, Roy Batty. It's uh, yeah, it's Basic Pleasure Model is what he changed his name to. Hence our uh, Blade Runner up there. It's a direct reference to Blade Runner. So he at least has good taste in movies and literature. So. Whether it came from a Philip K. Dick yeah. thing in the book. But uh, the first, uh, it was cool because uh, he never released a full album. He always released singles. Oh, yeah, those were just two singles, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. Uh, the first one called Sunyata. That's a great song. Like, it's a bit more, uh, it, it carries over from the remix of one of our submarines. It's pretty atmospheric in nature. Again, a great showcase for uh, Paul Sebastian's vocals, vocal style. And uh, it's the awesome thing about the Sunyata single is it's a maxi single. There's like seven or eight versions of the song. And uh, the other cool thing about it is uh, we were starting to break away from the 90s idea of remixing. Whenever you remix the song in the 90s, you have, you have to, to keep. You have to follow through with most of the song. You are basically allowed to change uh, instruments and things of that. You nature. have to observe the forms of Canley, but uh, whereas with, later all you have to do is with early two thousands. Basically, all you had to do was drop Paul Sebastian into your mix, and you can call it a remix of Sunyata, which makes. Uh, Maxi singles way more interesting. 12 inch single. Because uh, they stylistically changed throughout the album. So it was a good move for uh, EDM culture and uh, it was a great move on the part of Paul Sebastian. So a year later, 
after Sunyata comes out, uh, there was the other song. How to Live. How to Live, yeah, where he doesn't tell you how to live in the song. It's just the song name is How to Live. Just letting you know that that's the title. Yeah, so again, uh, it's a little more pop oriented, it's less atmospheric, but you can't feature Paul Sebastian without him singing. And uh, he actually, for the original mix, got this guy named uh, Caesar Filori to uh, help him write it. Italian guy. A notable man. Very notable. So, you know, it's a gr another great maxi single. Follow the maxi single format again. And then, uh, where are we in terms of the lyrical themes? Is it the uh, depressing? No. Are we are we still extropian with it? With uh, Paul Sebastian, uh, the lyrical the lyric theme was dark. I I don't think it was quite as dark. That may have been Theo with uh, at least cycling robots. Yeah, there there, yeah there is a bit of uh, maybe a hint of sci-fi in there somewhere. I would have to go back and read the lyrics again. But. So those are the two. Efforts by what's it called? Basic pleasure model. Yeah. So yeah. Your two songs by basic pleasure model. And then uh, after that, he dropped the basic pleasure model name and worked for Microsoft in uh, sound engineering for Gears of War is what he's most known for. So it's not like he just dropped off the face of the earth either. He was still doing stuff just in a different capacity. Didn't so, want to be somebody's pleasure girl. That's right. Yeah. It's the whole music industry thing. Commentary. Yeah. On no longer. Yeah. He didn't want to be Rachel anymore. So, We've all seen Cyberzone. Yeah. So. Moving right along. Yeah, basically. the uh, years to, uh, where would we be at now? The mid-2000 years? Well, I mean, yeah, now we're... I mean, hey, that's basically it. Like, well, that's the last thing we heard from yeah, Paul Sebastian. The last thing is he worked on the sound engineering for, I think it was either God of, or Gears of War 3 or 4. Dubstep, or no, that's the other guy. And, uh, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, ho hopefully so him or both were able to still crank out the uh, yeah. video game deals. So, well, like I say, I am definitely the right. person who doesn't know anything about not only the genre, but the, or not only the group, but the genre yeah. overall. I'm not a fan of electronic dance music per se. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get my booty on the floor. I don't listen to a lot of techno or, or dance music when they're in the different subgenres, so I can't really weigh in aside from the clear evidences, or clear to me. Of the opportunism. Yeah. The 93 album sounded very 89 ish. Mm -hmm. You got a thing that sounds like Downward Spiral. It was from some years after. Mm -hmm. The fact that he made this dubstep thing. Yeah. And uh, whatever the other couple examples of it were. Well, I mean. I can't take a position on the debate. Because I don't know enough about how electronic music, dance music, works in the EDM world. I'll at least put forth the question, though. You're right. Do you think they count as genre opportunists? Or are we going to give them a little more credit? Yeah, to me. As guys in the scene of EDM. Yeah, to call it, call it the fanboyism. Call it being a major fan. My my opinion may be a bit slighted, but I would go ahead and put them up there with the ranks of uh, insert anthem trance guy here, uh, Nine Inch Nails, although they're in a different genre, and uh, I think they do stand as titans of the mix master, the uh, master of mixing. Oh yeah, what was it called? Masterful Mix Wizards? Yeah. To me, they, they stand up. They did a good, even if 
even if opportunism was a means, the end product was fantastic. So. What was my DJ name again? Prescription RX. Yeah, that's what it was. 